Hi there. Welcome to Headwaters Science Institute's Lunch with a Scientist. Join us as we talk with working scientists from all over the world as we explore what science research in their career actually looks like. We will host a new scientist every other week and allow them to present their research and follow that up with an open-ended question and answer session. We hope exposure to these professionals will allow students to not only see what type of research is possible, but also see what kinds of careers are accessible. And hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun along the way. And what you might be able to see here, and believe it or not, in this image, just outside of the wave break where the surfers are, are 10 juvenile white sharks, ranging between five and about eight feet long, hanging out off this beach and in amongst people. So why are they there? What are they doing there? How long are they gonna be there? And if that's your favorite place to go surfing, should you be worried? Oh, studying sharks, you go out and you dive with them and, and then you probably look at them and figure out what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, let me tell you, that is not how we study sharks. White sharks are coming back to California. And the simple reason for that is they were protected. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Lunch with a Scientist. My name is Jen. I am the Program and Outreach Manager for the Headwater Science Institute. Today, we are excited to have Dr. Chris Lowe joining us. Dr. Chris Lowe is a full professor in marine biology and the director of the Shark Lab at California State University, Long Beach where he and his students use acoustic and satellite telemetry techniques to study the movement, behavior, and physiology of sharks, rays, and game fishes. As our climate and ocean and a marine life change, Dr. Lowe has become adept at speaking to the media and the public about the challenges and conservation success stories about marine predators in some parts of the world. So I'm gonna go ahead and have Dr. Lowe join us. So hi, Dr. Lowe. How are you today? Doing well. How are you? Doing fantastic. So we always start our programs by asking you, you know, how did you get involved in studying in your field? So studying sharks in the ocean. Yeah. So that's a kind of an interesting story. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my presentation because um, I come from a background that is probably not like most people in academia. I came from a blue collar family. Um, I, nobody in my family ever went to college. So when I thought, you know, I, I thought I'd be a marine biologist. My family were like, why <laughs> do people get paid to do that? And it was just always assumed that I would, you know, follow in my parents' footsteps. I would be a carpenter or a commercial fisherman or something like that. But um, I had a different path in mind. I just didn't know how to find that path. And I kind of stumbled along. And fortunately, I was able to, to make it here, which has been an amazing journey. Yeah, I've heard that from many marine biologists, you know, including myself, you know, I want to do this. I love the ocean. I'm passionate. Oh, are there really any jobs in it? And lo and behold, there's a ton of jobs yeah. <laughs> um, available in the marine sciences. All right. So thank you. So with that, do you want to go ahead and pull up the presentation and we'll get rolling? Sure. So a lot of times people ask, well, how did you actually get in a career where you studied sharks and, and what's the path for that? And believe it or not, there really isn't a defined path. And that's something I want to talk about today. So people ask, how did I get here? So believe it or not, I grew up on a small island located off Cape Cod called Martha's Vineyard. And that island is, is actually a pretty cool place to grow up. My grandfather was a commercial fisherman. And my mom's family had been on Martha's Vineyard for over 200 years. Many of them had been whalers, farmers, commercial fishermen. So here I am with my grandfather. You know, I don't remember actually learning how to swim. I just knew how to do it. Or going fishing was something I always did growing up. I became certified to dive at 16 and have been diving ever since. So I've spent thousands of hours underwater. So as a kid growing up on this island in a blue collar family, there was really nothing else to do but go fishing or diving or boating. So the other really interesting thing about my growing up there was that's where they filmed Jaws. And, and you would think that that might have been influential in my interest in sharks, but I was actually interested in sharks before Jaws came out. So what's really interesting and my parents and family love to point out is that I really wasn't a good student growing up. I struggled with reading and math. 
I just wasn't interested in school, but I loved to fish. And one day I was nine years old. I was out fishing and I caught a dogfish and I didn't know what it was. I had caught hundreds of other fish, never a dogfish. So it actually made me go to the library and I had to look it up in a book to figure out what it was. And I found a book about sharks and that was it for me. So from then on, I kind of became interested in this notion of maybe going to school for marine biology, becoming a marine biologist, someone who would study sharks. So believe it or not, I spent 13 years in college after high school. So I got a bachelor's degree in marine biology at Barrington College in Rhode Island. That took me four years. I took two years off and traveled throughout Central America and worked on the Cape. And then I got my master's degree in biology at Cal State Long Beach Shark Lab. And I got to work with one of the world's premier shark behaviorists, Dr. Don Nelson. So following that, I went to the University of Hawaii where I got a PhD in zoology studying hammerhead sharks. And then unfortunately, Dr. Nelson passed away in 1997 and I was hired as his replacement in 1998. So basically what got me into this field was my, dis my interest in discovering new things. And to give you an example, when I was a graduate student at the University of Hawaii, my wife, Dr. Goodman Lowe, and I found this cool discovery that hammerhead sharks could suntan when exposed to ultraviolet light. It's the first time anybody had ever figured that out. And we had to do this cool experiment to actually figure out that it was UV light that was inducing the suntanning, just like in humans. So, so that discovery was amazing. That was something that literally I couldn't sleep at night because we had to get the answer to this problem. Was it really UV causing that? In addition, it, it also fostered my love to build things. You know, my dad was a carpenter. You know, I learned how to build things at a very young age and I became very interested in technology. So despite the fact that I had a poor math background, I became so interested in building things that for my PhD, I built this swim tunnel respirometer for sharks. And I had no idea how to do it, but I love that process of trying to figure out how to make it work and make it work right. In addition, I learned how to build my own acoustic transmitters. I was the first to build a Fitbit for a shark, which would count the shark's tail beat frequencies. So I got really intrigued by technology. And even though, you know, I didn't have a background for it, I started to surround myself with people who did. And I barraged them with questions. Uh, how does this work? And what's the physics behind it? And in that process, I slowly became more and more math proficient and more interested in how technology works and how to make new technology. I would have to say the key to my success throughout all this process, because I really started at a deficit, was my willingness to work hard and the excitement about learning new things. That was what I think has truly enabled me to be where I am today. So as the director of the Shark Lab, one of the longest and oldest running shark research facilities in the United States, I can't tell you how exciting it is for me to continue to develop new technology and introduce students to the excitement of doing this themselves and to generate that next generation of shark scientists. So it's really funny when people ask me, well, you know, what is it like studying sharks? If I were to ask them to draw me a picture or pull a photo off the web, this is what they would say. This is what it looks like to them. Like, oh, studying sharks, you go out and you dive with them and, and then you probably look at them and figure out what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, let me tell you, that is not how we study sharks. And, and it's a very uh, narrow perspective on how we actually do this. So the bottom line is the field of studying sharks has changed tremendously in the last 10 years. So for example, let's say we have a question and that question is a problem. Why are there so many white sharks off the California coast? Okay, so that requires answers that are gonna have to come from more fields than just marine biology. So for example, if I only used my field of biology, which originally was all I was interested in, I would not have the knowledge of geology to understand the habitat that sharks were using, the math behind why they were selecting this environment, not that environment, the computer science capabilities that would be needed to take all the data my new technology gets me, and then use that to answer some of these questions, the engineering to build new technology to answer the question we're trying to answer. And of course, chemistry is always involved and so is physics. 
So the bottom line is to be a good shark scientist these days, we have to be knowledgeable in all of these fields. But the other part that I've learned is you also have to be knowledgeable in other fields because it's not just sharks that we're learning about. It's how sharks interact with people. And that requires, believe it or not, some knowledge of PR and marketing. It requires some knowledge of psychology. Why do people think the way they do? And why do they have this innate fear of sharks? And how do we overcome that? It's quite often, the best way to take science and translate it into a, a language that everybody can understand requires art and graphics. And then, of course, there's simple economics. So if a shark bites a person, what economic impact is that going to have to that community? And for how long? And how important is my science in helping to reduce that impact? So believe it or not, studying sharks requires a blending of all these fields. So I'm going to start with some really simple questions. And these are ones that we've been asking. So in my 30 years of studying sharks in California, I never thought I would see the day where on any given day I could go off a beach in Southern California and find a white shark. And I can do that now. 30 years ago, if you'd asked me if that was possible, I would have said no. Sharks are being decimated. Their populations are being eliminated in many places faster than they can recover. We'll, we'll probably never see this. And of course, I was wrong. White sharks are coming back in California. And the simple reason for that is they were protected. They were protected back in 1994. We've done a better job at managing our commercial fisheries, which has reduced impacts on those populations. And more importantly, the things that they like to eat. So now as a result, we are seeing lots of white sharks off our beaches. And this of course raises all sorts of questions. So here's some cool drone video and what you might be able to see here, and believe it or not in this image, just outside of the wave break where the surfers are, are 10 juvenile white sharks ranging between five and about eight feet long, hanging out off this beach and in amongst people. So why are they there? What are they doing there? How long are they gonna be there? And if that's your favorite place to go surfing, should you be worried? So to believe it or not, to answer many of those questions requires many of our science tools. So we start by asking these questions and then taking some of that information to develop some hypotheses. So can we predict why that's happening? So we have three possible reasons as to why these young white sharks might be hanging out off these beaches. One, believe it or not, we don't know where they give birth. We just know babies start showing up off our beaches in April. And the question is, why do they get so close to shore? Well, one reason might be that's the safest place for them to be. So believe it or not, they don't know they're a white shark yet. They're still a baby. They're naive. They're afraid of everything. So the safest place to be is in shallow water. Now, if that's your safe place, let's say that's your nursery where you're gonna hang out and grow and learn, you have to stay there for weeks to months at a time. What are you gonna eat? And how are you gonna catch it? So the next question is, where the answer might be, the reason why they're there is because there are lots of easy to capture food. And the number one thing we find in juvenile white shark stomachs are stingrays. And we have millions of stingrays along our beaches. Sometimes so many stingrays that you can't even see the sand they carpet the bottom. Third possibility is that even though white sharks are endothermic, as long as they swim, they can keep their body cores warmer than the water. And there's a big advantage to that. The smallest ones might not be very good at keeping the heat and therefore act like a cold body shark. The other possible explanation as to why they're so close to shore is because the water is warmer closer to the beach than it is further offshore. The sun warms it during the day. And therefore, that might be the other reason why they're there. So those are a lot of predictions. How are we going to test those predictions? So the question that we have to try to get at is how sharks are taking in information. How do they perceive their environment? And then how do they use that information in context to make decisions? How do they figure out, I'm going to stay at this beach for this long. Okay, things aren't the way I like it. They're changing. I don't like conditions. I'm going to leave and search for another beach. How do I decide what beach to go to next? So to answer those questions, scientists like myself use a variety of technology. And this is the part I love, right? So we use technology called spot tags. These are satellite transmitters that we can bolt to the shark's dorsal fin. And when the shark's dorsal fin breaks the surface, 
this satellite transmitter that's using radio waves is transmitting to satellites in orbit. And then those satellites in orbit can actually triangulate a position of where that shark is in space and time. So every time that fin breaks the surface, it's using radio signals to send a signal to the satellites. And then I get an email or a text message saying the shark is at this latitude and longitude at this time and date with this ID. The minute that transmitter goes underwater, it stops transmitting because radio waves cannot penetrate through seawater. Okay, so sharks are not like green mammals. They don't have to come to the surface to breathe. So how else might we figure out where they are in the water? So the other type of transmitter we use are called pop-off archiving satellite tags, PAT tags. Now these get darted into the shark's back. They have a temperature sensor, a light sensor, and a depth sensor. We program them to record temperature, light, and depth at intervals of every 30 to five minutes, 30 seconds to five minutes. And then at a pre-described time and date, this device hanging off the shark's back will pop off, float to the surface, upload all that data to the satellite, which then downloads it to me in an email. So using that information, we get a really accurate temperature and depth profile that that shark's moved through. But we can also use the light data to tell us day length. And if we know day length, we can estimate its latitude and longitude. Now that's not terribly accurate. It's anywhere from 60 nautical miles to 300 nautical miles. So there's a big error around that. So if we really wanna know how close, say a shark's getting to a beach, we use another technology called acoustic telemetry. So instead of using radio waves, now we're using lower frequency sound waves, which travel better through seawater. So now if we catch that shark, we can surgically implant a transmitter that has a unique ID code that can last up to 10 years. And if we don't catch that shark, we can actually dart one of these transmitters into the shark's back. Now, anytime that shark gets within about 300 yards of one of our underwater acoustic receivers that are all along Southern California beaches, that receiver will log the time, the date, and the ID number of that shark. So it enables us to determine how close do they get to the beach and how much time they're spending there. And the fourth type of technology we use are called smart tags. Think of those like Fitbits for sharks, and I'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. So now, obviously, in order to get this technology on or in an animal, you either have to capture it. So one way that we do that is by working with commercial fishermen who accidentally will catch white sharks in their nets. We had to build a relationship with them so they trust us. Then they would call us and say, I've got a shark. I'm going to be at the dock. We race down to the dock. We can take measurements. We can take blood samples, tissue samples of that shark for genetic analysis, health analysis, fit them with a variety of transmitter types, take them out, let them go. Another technique we might use if the shark is a little too large is we can drive alongside them with a boat or a jet ski. and We can dart a transmitter into the shark's back. We can use a drone to spot them and also use that drone to estimate how big that shark is. We have a dip cam that we can dip underneath the water to see whether it's a male or a female. And in some cases, the sharks are so close to the beach that we use a technique called strike netting. This is where we use a drone to spot the shark. We can sneak up in front of it and put a piece of net in the water. The shark gets entangled in the net. We can quickly remove it and do the same thing we would if we got it from a commercial fisherman. But by far my grad student's favorite way of tagging is this way. So there on the back of a lifeguard jet ski, we're using a drone to spot the shark. Then we can roll into the water and dart a transmitter into the shark's back. So using this technique, because we get these aggregations of these sharks, we can tag five or six sharks in just a couple hours. To give you an idea how shallow these sharks can get, that student is standing. So that's how shallow these sharks may move in close to shore. Now give you an idea how some of this technology works. We can use the pop-off archiving satellite tags to look at migration patterns of these sharks. So here's a baby white shark that was tagged off Ventura in 2007. And what you're gonna see is an animation here where we have sea surface temperature daily. So this is daily sea surface temperature. There's a clock up top or a date counter. And what you're gonna see is somewhere in the middle of that black smudge is the estimated position of where that shark is. So you can see it's hanging out off Southern California till about October. And then you see sea surface temperature in the more green to blue starts to drop. And when water temperatures dip below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, that was a cue that initiates migration of these sharks. So many of the juvenile white sharks that we tagged in Southern California during the summer migrated all the way down to Baja where they overwintered. Now we had a cool opportunity to do an experiment in 2007 where a juvenile white shark was caught in Ventura, a baby, was taken up to Monterey Bay Aquarium, kept an exhibit for almost six months where that shark gained 100 pounds 
but it was released in Monterey, California in February, where the water temperature is more like 50 degrees. So you can see that baby white sharks can tolerate cold water. They just don't like it. And quite often they would migrate all the way down to Mexico. And then in the spring, we get these slugs of warm water that come up from the equator and push up into the Gulf of California. And what you can see is that warm water actually drove the shark up into the Gulf. When that tag popped off, the surface water was over 84 degrees. So what these little experiments were telling us is that juvenile white sharks don't like water too cold and they also don't like it too warm. So using our acoustic telemetry, we're able to track individuals along a California coast. So those little flashes you see, and up top there's a date and time counter, are where we're detecting juveniles hanging out at beaches. So we had individuals that would spend weeks to months at a time using a two mile stretch of beach, just cruising back and forth. So this helps us answer that question about what makes a beach a good nursery. So these data basically occurred during El Nino. And what was really interesting about that was our water temperatures never dipped below 65 degrees during that year because it was so warm, none of the sharks migrated. They all overwintered that year. So one of the challenges we have with our underwater acoustic receivers is that a diver has to go pick that up and download it. The lifeguards want to know when they're tagged white sharks off their beaches, especially larger ones, for public safety. So we actually work with the manufacturer. This guy right here, Darnell Gadbury, is my computer scientist and engineer in the lab. He basically built and sold two biotech companies and was helping me develop new technology that would help us tell lifeguards when a shark was nearby. So to do that, we have an acoustic receiver that's hanging underneath a buoy. There's a GPS location or, and a cell modem and a solar panel on this. So anytime a tag shark gets within 300 yards of the buoy, instead of a diver having to pick it up to download it, now this transmits data directly via cell to lifeguards that have subscriptions to the service. And they will actually know how big that shark was, when it was detected at the buoy, how long it's been there, and where that shark has been over the last few months. So in order to answer some of those other questions, like are they there for stingrays? Are they there for meals? Are they there for the warm water? We combine technology. We use things like underwater robots to help us map the underwater environment in 3D. We use aerial drones to help us spot sharks and track them and look at their proximity to people. In addition, we also use eDNA. We can take a water sample and ask, is there a white shark in this water or based on the DNA that's left off their bodies? So if we have an aggregation of white sharks in an area, we can put out an array of acoustic receivers. And if a shark is detected by three or more, we can use math to actually determine its exact position based on the time of arrival of the signal from the transmitter to three or more receivers. So using this, we can track a, an aggregation of individuals. We can use a drone to fly over and count how many sharks are out there, estimate their sides, regardless of whether they're met, tagged or not. And then we can also look at their proximity to people. So by using all this technology, we are now gathering huge, huge amounts of data. So our, our favorite piece of technology we use are called smart tags. This has a 3D accelerometer, 3D gyroscope, 3D magnetometer, and we clamp this on the shark's dorsal fin like a little backpack. The black tube you see there is a video logger so we can see what the shark sees. We can put this on the shark. There's an acoustic transmitter on it so we can follow that shark for 24 hours. And after 24 hours, this thing is designed to pop off. Now this device measures every single motion the shark makes 30 times a second in addition to the temperature and depth. So when we did this with a couple sharks off Long Beach, we were able to get some really cool data. So you can see that we can look at the depth that the shark moved through, its compass heading. We get what is known as overall dynamic body acceleration, how, the body, how much the body is moving. That translates to calories burned. We can look at its tail beat amplitude, its tail beat frequency, and the water temperature it moves through. But the coolest thing we found was we noticed from the video that these sharks are swimming in a 45 degree angle in a bank in a 30 foot di diameter circle. And they would do that for 20 minutes and they would reverse and go the opposite direction. And then they reverse and go the opposite direction. And they would do this for four hours. So why are these sharks swimming in a tight circle like that? Well, it turns out that migratory birds, dolphins, whales actually will turn off half their brain and go on autopilot for a bit. So white sharks are obligate ram ventilators, which means they must continuously swim in order to breathe. 
So basically what this might show is how a white shark can actually sleep while still moving to respire. So this is probably one of our coolest tools. This is called an autonomous underwater vehicle. This has an entire environmental sensor suite on its nose, and we can program this to go out, move up and down through the water column, and basically mow the lawn. So we can provide a high resolution 3D map of that area. In addition, working with roboticists, we've developed shark tracking robots. So we can actually put hydrophones on a device like this, and we can teach it how to follow a shark. So what you're seeing in animation here is the red dots are where the robot thinks a shark is. The blue is the actual robot, and we can program the robot to mimic the shark's behavior. We can tell the robot never to get within 100 yards of the tagged shark. So right now you can see that shark is kind of staying in one spot, and the robot stays in one spot. But as the shark starts to move, you will see that the robot will start to change its path and begin to follow that shark. So basically, we are teaching robots to behave like sharks. And it's writing its own algorithms on how to change its behavior based on the change of behavior that it's recording from the sharks. How cool is that? Okay, so we also use drones and they've become a very powerful tool in science. So commercial drones that you can buy off the shelf like DJI Phantoms or Mavics are great. They have high resolution cameras. They got a really good GPS and clock in them. So by doing that, we can use those to get a bird's eye view of what sharks are doing off our beaches and when they're in and amongst people. So here you can see a baby white shark being trying to be chased by a lifeguard jet ski. They just don't care. In addition, we can use that by working with computer scientists and engineers to develop algorithms that will track individuals. So here you can see us tracking an aggregation of leopard sharks using this technology. So there's a bounding box around every single one of those objects, which is a shark. And we can ask, are those sharks looking for a particular environmental condition? or are they there for social reasons? So are individuals interacting with the same individuals? Are they all looking for the same condition? In addition, we can use these images that we get from the video to actually recognize different species. So here's some video footage of our surveys that we do in Southern California, just using an off-the-shelf drone to not only count sharks, but we don't know how many people are in the ocean. We don't know what they're doing, where they are in proximity from the shoreline, where they are in proximity from the wave break, and how close are to the sharks? So by using this technology, we're able to survey huge amounts of California coastline, but then we have hundreds of hours of video to go through. So by working together with engineers and computer scientists, we're developing machine learning algorithms that will help us to identify all those objects, like a surfer sitting down looks different from a surfer sitting or riding a wave. How does that look different from a stand-up paddle board or a body board? So by using this technology, we're developing new mathematical algorithms that will help us identify these objects so that our student doesn't have to do that. The technology will do it itself. So once we gather all the science, there's lots of opportunities for people to help us translate that so that the public can understand it. So here's an example of something we do in Southern California. This is one of our shark shacks. This is one of our public outreach centers. So we can move these along public beaches. We can teach people about the technology we're using to study these sharks and at the same time, educate them about beach safety. Are there sharks out there? Sure. Will they bother you? Probably not. In fact, we have lots of data now to suggest that sharks are in and amongst people all the time, and they tend to ignore people. So by providing that information to the public, we're reducing those fears. So believe it or not, a lot of my students that participate in this outreach and education component have that science background, but choose to use it to educate the public. So the bottom line is to be a shark scientist, we need more than biologists. We need physicists and chemists and oceanographers and engineers. We need programmers, mathematicians, economists, psychologists, sociologists, artists, animators, educators, all alike. And believe it or not, sharks bring people together. So the idea here is sharks can make STEM interesting and exciting. You don't have to be a biologist to be interested in sharks or to be interested in technology. In addition, we use some of this technology and some of this information that we've learned to come up with fun ways to teach kids about science. For example, we have our Beach Days comic book series, which focuses on beach safety. We have one now on marine pollution, and we have a third one coming out that will be all about how we study sharks, shark spies. So with that, thank you. 
Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> um, we do have a couple of questions just to follow up. So the first one for me, we, we, you know, we run a research experience program and the whole idea is to get kids having hands-on science and actually using data. And I love what you said that I was, I wasn't good at math. You know, I also wasn't good at math and didn't think that sci maybe I couldn't do science because you always hear you have to be good at math. And a lot of what you're doing is actually engineering, um, creating those, those acoustic, you know, the tags and you called it, you know, the Fitbit for shark. So for the, for the kids watching and the teachers, how valuable do you think getting that hands-on and that field experience has been for you and in students that you work with? So I, I would argue that I had a fear of math. It wasn't that I couldn't do it. It was that I had a fear of it. Mm -hmm. and, and what I found was getting in the field and trying to do science started to show me that I had to do math. And it wasn't that scary. Um, and I started small, right? You don't go to, I'm going to answer some big mathematical formula and it's going to be calculus and with differential equations. No, 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 no. It was easy math. And then once I convinced myself I could do easy math, then uh, let's up the game. So, and then I began to realize that that was a fear. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't that I couldn't do it. It was that I blocked myself from doing it. And then I found that the more I wanted to learn, that it, it, it basically said, I said, you can't be afraid of this because you need it. And, and it opened up all these new worlds for me. So, uh, you know, I, I look back to my grade school, Chris, who is, who is just hated math class. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now look at where I am today and think, you know, if I had only learned to overcome that fear back then, wow. So, and then the engineering part, you know, I, I do this all the time. I, I get a new piece of technology and the first thing I want to know is how does it work? Mm -hmm. what, how does this technology work? And then I, I start small. I look for little articles and then I, I dig deeper and I dig deeper and it gets a little scary because you begin to realize exactly how complicated it is. But at the same time, when you realize how simple it is, you kind of want to keep nibbling away. Yeah, it's almost that, that application side of it and that passion behind what you're doing. It, it makes it cool and fun and interesting. Um, same thing with chemistry, too. Chemistry was that other one that a lot of people just block and think that they just like, nope, this isn't for me. But once you if you like the ocean, and you start looking at the chemistry of the water. I mean, it's just a whole new world and it's exciting mm -hmm. and it makes sense of how everything works. So. Yeah, that, that hands on that passion, I think, is just so important for for the students watching to understand, like, you can do this. Like Dr. Lowe is telling you, just find that little that little area that makes it exciting for you. Um, so like you were saying, I, you know, growing up in Martha's Vineyard where they filmed Jaws and all of, there was a lot of fallout from Jaws mm -hmm. with sharks. It actually made me like sharks a little bit more, but some people had the opposite reaction. Um, you know, have you seen in your research and, and the abundance of research going on, um, that it has shaped that public perception of sharks? It has. Oh, oh, it clearly has. And there's good scientific evidence that it has. In fact, I've teamed up with a psychologist here who specializes in the study of fear. So we're conducting surveys because we want to understand why people think the way they do about sharks. Because if we can understand why they think the way they do, then we can better understand how to change that. So there are lots of people out there who have loads of irrational fears. We call irrational fears. They don't feel irrational to them. But to us, we might look and go, well, that's irrational. There are people that are scared of spiders. There are people that are scared of snakes. Um, and some of those animals, once they begin to learn more about them, um, those fears start to go away, like me and math, right? So I, I think that's the key. And, and what we want to try to do now is understand why people think the way they do. And then once we know that, then we can, we can start to share a science with them in a way that hopefully will help them shed those fears. Yeah, it's pretty exciting to know you live in an area where there's a nursery for great white sharks. Um, 
New York up is, is another area. Did you see a lot of juveniles growing up? Because in that area in the Hamptons, no. I know there's no. No. See, but this is the difference, right? Yeah. This is what we call the sliding baseline. So I grew up at a time on Martha's Vineyard where a lot of things were fished out. There were no sharks. There were no seals. So all those animals have come back since, since I left Massachusetts. And that's amazing, right? Those are, despite all the bad news we hear about our environment, the fact that those animals have come back means we've done some things right and that there's hope. So remember those protecting sharks, protecting seals, those were, those were big deals. There were hard fought battles to do that. And a lot of people said, you shouldn't do this. This is, this is crazy. And a lot of people said, we have to do this. And it's taken decades, mm -hmm. but those animals are coming back. And that means it can be done. We can solve problems. We can bring animals back. So for me, that's incredibly exciting because it's easy to get discouraged about all the bad news we hear about the environment. But in reality, if we work together, we can solve these problems. Yeah, there's definitely been a lot of successes in recent years in the marine sciences, just by, like you're saying, the policies and protection and just new information that we're learning. It's really nice to hear that it's on both coasts as well, that we're starting to see that success story um, with these with these large, you know, apex predators. Um, so you talked a lot about juvenile white sharks. Um, do you have you seen any uh, movements or observations with other life stages because you know there's mm -hmm. multiple stages with a with a great white shark um so what kinds of things have you noticed between the two of them or multiples of those so what's interesting is while we focus primarily on the juveniles because they spend so much time at the beach um, the adults obviously have to come to southern california females to give birth but we don't see them along our beaches so that tells us something, right? So most adult white sharks that have been tracked basically show up like males show up in the late summer, early fall through winter when the elephant seals are in at their rookeries. And that's their favorite thing to eat in California. Females will come and give birth in sometime in the spring. And then they're also hanging out off the, off the offshore islands. That's where all our seals and sea lion rookeries are. So they're not along our beaches where the people are. So it's a very different situation than say Cape Cod, where your seals are right on public beaches. There are very few small islands where they can go hang out by themselves that aren't near people. And in California, most of those islands are 30 plus miles away from the coastline. So that keeps the adults in a different place from the juveniles. And that's what makes Southern California beaches such good nurseries because adults will eat the juveniles if they're around. So have you noticed any changes in the way that they moved um, with sea surface temperatures kind of changing or increasing decrease? I mean, the, weather, the climate's been a little bonkers, so. Yes, yeah, so it, despite the fact that it's bonkers, the ocean is still getting progressively warmer, right? No matter where you go. Mm -hmm. So we used to only see white shark nurseries as far north as Southern California. And a few years ago, we started to see white shark nursery up in Monterey, which is kind of surprising because the water historically was much colder. But oceanographers are now documenting the fact that Monterey Bay is getting progressively warmer. So it's become warm enough that it, it can be used as a nursery. And we now attribute that to a sign of climate change, right? In addition, the adults probably that's affecting the adult movement patterns because it's affecting the seasonality of the seals. So that same pattern is probably going to start to change the pattern of adult movements. So we're starting to see seals move further north than we have in the past, especially the favorite ones like northern elephant seals, which means adult white sharks might start showing up off British Columbia, places where they typically weren't seen that often. So climate change might start redistributing some of these sharks to places where they really weren't that common. So another good example of that could be Nova Scotia right? Because the Gulf of Maine is getting progressively warmer. So now that could be related to climate change. The fact that they're seeing so many more adult white sharks off those areas. We don't really know yet. And that's why we have to keep tagging sharks and tracking sharks and looking at the environment to see whether this pattern is going to continue or not. 
Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. Uh, that was fantastic. And I know that there's so much information that our students are gonna get from this and learn all about how cool white sharks actually are. Um, especially when you talk about baby, any kind of a baby animal. I mean, everybody loves the baby animals. Of course. Um, yeah. So if you would like to learn how you can do your own research project, um, including even if you want to study sharks or the ocean, we do have our summer research experience opening up on February 1st. And you can go ahead and register on our website and click on our research experience. We also can answer any questions you have by emailing us at info at headwaterscienceinstitute.org. So again, thank you so much for meeting with us today. If you would like to learn more about Dr. Lowe's work at the Shark Lab, you can go ahead and visit this website and you can see all the really amazing projects that they have going on, as well as information on their education programs. We are going to link their programming on this talk. So and if you wanna see what uh, resources they have available, go ahead and click on the resources that we've posted. So thank you again, Dr. Lowe, and I look forward to continuously following what you're doing and learning more about uh, Great Whites on the West Coast of uh, the United States. Great, thank you.